that would be awesome. And, and then you can add a coda about how relevant um, his thinking is today and how that fits and other people could have opinions and all that kind of stuff. We could riff on it and fold it in, fold it into the thing. Can we call them elegant, <laughs> elegant handles? Um, because, you know, if complexity is here, simplicity is sort of on this side of it. Elegance is going through the complexity. Um, um, and so I think, you know, Latour couldn't have come up with what he came up with without going through the processing of all of that complexity. Um, and so, yeah, I think this idea of the elegant handle is, is it's on the other side of complexity, so. Sounds great, so elephant handles. Elegant, <laughs> elephant, elephant handles. I mean, maybe that's <laughs> true, I like it. Um, cool, well, welcome everybody. We're uh, on our Thursday OGM call, Neil. Uh, it's lovely to see you all. We check in, uh, normally the order I pick is to, I go look at my grid and I go from the, from the most recent arrivals back up so that we don't always get the, the early birds first. Uh, and we're just checking in. So it's uh, what's OGME that's in your life. And we'd like to do it with a little bit of pace today because I think Matt would like to uh, spend some time presenting the workshop he's, uh, he and his team have uh, designed. And, uh, and then I sent a second invite for an 8 a.m. call tomorrow where we can do some more talking about that and, and uh, flesh things out and just figure things out as well. So if we run out of time today, we've got time tomorrow to start doing this. And you'll see it's a, it's a progressive design where we, we've got pre-work, we've got some homework uh, going into the 29th, which is when the workshop is. Um, so let's start with, uh, oh great. Uh, let's not start with George because this is, I think his first OGM call. So let's start with uh, Hamilton Neil J. Hi guys, happy Thursday to all of you. Um, that's all I have to say. I just spent the past hour being IT support for a 14 year old. Oh, um, perfect. Our, it's a question of who, what's more fragile, her anxiety or our IT network. It's uh, both. So anyway, <laughs> it's good to see you all. That's gonna be my update for today. Glad to Thanks. be here. Thanks Hamilton. Uh, Neil J. Jamie. That's not fair, Hamilton. I was hoping for at least five minutes preparation time, and now look at me. I'm just dropped in it. I feel like an elephant trying to go through the elegant handle thing. Yeah, no. Um, I've got my trunk in, um, but generally the rest of me is too big for most people. And so I've been having some of those interesting uh, challenges of trying to bring what I've recently come across the term as sort of an eco poetic approach to sensing into what needs to be considered before we get to the detailed design stage, before we get forced into other people's boxes, before we get forced into the expectations of an agenda. And that's been a, a tricky uh, couple of weeks for me because I've been gently stretching agendas, uh, but having difficulty within my own team to get them to recognize the validity of bringing that size of potentially changing the culture of Europe to the project even though the hints are there for somebody who can see the connections like me. And then when I carefully word the right questions at the right times, when that team is in conjunction with the team that's trying to, to bring them in, the other teams are all going, and I still can't get my team to see the validity of what I've been doing. And every time I bring it up, it's um, in the context of, oh, you know, he's telling us, I told you so. And it's like, yeah, fucking six weeks ago, you dickheads. <laughs> and so it's just this trying to get the elephant through the eye of the needle um, and recognizing the different levels of uh, hierarchy, the different levels of constraint, the different levels of consciousness, capability, maturity, uh, and literally developmental depth um, that are needed to try and thread this vertical uh, thread rather than the horizontal coordination thread. And the connection to uh, OGM is that as a, a knowledge slash wisdom commons with multiple curated inputs and multiple potential outputs, uh, a lot of this is going to come down to at what level are we communicating to whom about what, but what's the overarching vertical thread, which requires a more liminal space, not fully structured at first type thinking. So I'm holding those two things in juxtaposition, and I'll go and tend to my elephant. Thanks. 
it's, I think there might be a common thread in today's conversation. Uh, Jay, Jamie, Hank. Morning. Um, having grounded a bit back home uh, and reached out and trying to orient uh, how to support people in the valley, especially the the most vulnerable populations of people that have lost their homes. I've been having a lot of conversations on this territory um, in two major fronts. One being, um, what does almost like what does the future of housing look like? Uh, what how can we leverage some of the temporary structures that I love um, that I support such as geodesic domes and things like that um, in the current iteration to be able to support people that are just kind of floating around. Um, and also there was a ton of support that flooded in through GoFundMe to a lot of people that kind of, that told their stories and, or people that um, told uh, their friends stories. And the thing is that there's a gap between where that fund, the funds come in and actually where the housing buckets fill. So this kind of idea of, of creating a system that, that brings people from um, not just getting funded, but also connecting them with who has a piece of property, who has land, who has an extra room, like enhancing that. So been kind of heads, heads down in that and um, besides all my other things. Um, thanks, Jane. I was just typing in some background. You live in Ashland, Oregon, which is right close to several cities that were wiped out by the wildfires recently. So that's the, the context for, for what you're saying. Uh, Jamie, Hank, George. So hello. I think this is my first official OGM call. So it's Welcome. nice Thank to you. be here. Um, and what's OGME in my life is a variety of projects that I'm working on. One is the actual argument mining and knowledge curation project that is the Society Library. And we focus on three topics, COVID-19, election integrity issues, and climate change, which I'm looking to get back to. Um, we have a specific method for that. But in addition to just working on this knowledge curation and this logical articulation of all points of view on these subjects, I've also been working with um, a variety of different people in the information ecosystem. Um, because essentially we're mapping the territory of what's going wrong in our information ecosystem. Our relationship with information is clearly one of the most important relationships a human has um, and society has. So what's going wrong? What could be improved? And so we're mapping out what are the issues, who are the actors, and what are the projects um, that are in existence? And maybe we can steward a larger partnership and a more coordinated and effective response to some of the issues that we're seeing uh, perpetuating. So that's what I'm working on. That sounds incredibly OGME. Um, <laughs> Thank you. That's really, really tremendous. We really appreciate you being here. Mm -hmm. um, Hank, George, Judy. Yeah, well, welcome, Jamie. I don't know if I can really follow that up. I'm not working on anything nearly as elaborate. Um, <coughs> that said, uh, just kidding, I am. Sorry, Matt and Ham. <laughs> um, no, so just a little, little peek into my life. I mean, um, a couple things. One, I, I've been reading a lot more um, and uh, just a quick little thing. I started reading Man's Search for, for Meaning, which is a book by Viktor Frankl. Um, and just, I saw it on so many reading lists that I just decided to like read it and I didn't really look into it. And the first half of it, as some of you guys may know very well, is like his experience in, uh, in the work camps in Germany. And so I was just kind of like, okay, here we go. So um, I just feel like <laughs> I went to go see a movie called like House on the Hill and thought it was going to be like a nice pretty movie and then realized that it's like not a fun house to be in. Um, but I'm still like learning a lot from it. I think that that kind of shock really made me like pay very deep attention to it. Um, so that's kind of on the more like leisurely side, even though it's not doesn't feel super leisurely. Um, I think the second thing is, you know, we've talked a lot about the climate around here, whether it be social or political or whatnot. And I know in my past couple updates, I've given a couple um, just nods to the discourse uh, or lack thereof going around. Um, so I think I've taken the opportunity to really kind of dig into some of the arguments that I'm hearing on like the other side of issues that I take, um, really just to 
to, to one practice kind of like what, like not being scared of them. Um, not that, not that people who don't, t- you know, grapple with them are scared of them, but, um, you know, just kind of grappling with, with points of view that I don't necessarily subscribe to. Um, and it's been honestly extremely enlightening. Um, if not just to orient myself to like, okay, how are they thinking or how is this person thinking so that I can either strengthen my argument or just kind of really like understand where people are coming from. Um, and it's, it's been great. So those are my updates. Thank you, Hank. Um, that's an amazing exercise these days and uh in ordinary times that's kind of an abstract exercise these days that feels all too real um so uh george welcome to the call george judy uh kevin go ahead george and you'll need to unmute yourself the zoom down so can you hear me now yes okay so um, I'm the new kid on the block, and uh, it's very nice to meet with a number of uh, old friends uh, here. And um, so um, the last week was a very interesting one for me because uh, a number of areas of uh, my research interest and um, different communities of practice that I belong to seems to come together in uh, inspired in great degree by a new toy that I discovered that's uh, obsidian, which is um, the, my, my choice for uh, linking personal and collective uh, knowledge ecosystems. So there is this crowd, the people who are into knowledge ecology, uh, very much inspired by the Engelbart uh, DKR kind of thing. And then there is the other crowd, uh, sense makers, meaning makers, uh, all around uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger, series of sense making uh, and and then there is also um, people who are committed uh, to uh, profound uh, social transformation or movements for civilizational renewal and um, i feel being part of all three and it's uh, very interesting to see how these um, domains are articulating through my inquiry, not that I try to create a master map of anything, but more it's like a an truly emerging process, the new insights and inspirations are emerging from the conversations that I am having on, on Twitter, on email, in Zoom rooms, uh, and then I try to um, capture the highlights uh, to see, uh, you know, I just want to hang in long enough until some interesting patterns emerge that I can then uh, feed back to OGM and other places. So I'm, I'm very pleased of, inspired by the work that you guys are doing. I went through the Google Doc made made some comments and uh, yeah, originally my uh, first reaction was that, oh, there are so many other uh, globalizing uh, initiatives that is trying to be a hub for everything. But when I saw who are the people here and what is the quality of uh, thinking, uh, then I decided to, to join and uh, I want to contribute and be available, checked in. That is wonderful, George, thank you. And, and you're reminding me that in the last couple days I've had conversations, in, in some cases the same conversation that ranged from what, per, what uh, probability do you give that on November 15th there will be violence in the streets of the United States that is sort of more or worse than what Portland tasted you know, during this time, all the way over to 
in the event of a blue tsunami where it's a, it's a wipeout for the Republican Party, what should we do? Like, like, really, how would you reorder this country? What might you pass and do co to create like a layer of legislation and action that is like the, the New Deal of old? And, and there's talk of a Green New Deal, but the Green New Deal is, is sort of different. Like, what would you do if you took a clean slate? So those conversations are exciting. Uh, so it's at the same moment, like, like fear and excitement just all mingled in a moment when the cost of communicating is zero, the marginal cost of communicating is zero. So it's crazy. Um, so we have uh, Judy Kevin Scott. Good morning, everybody. Um, I love where we're going, both the depth and the action. It's sort of like the honey spot of how to really make change happen as we reach out to other people. And I think the nexus is that for us, for me anyway, I'm just trying to take the thinking and the possible action plans and the tools to all of the individuals and communities I can interface with here, which is a couple of different nonprofits where I'm on the board, some folks at the university, some students who are doing outreach, um, some neighborhood groups. And the traction is starting to build, which is really exciting. And it, it, what I'm finding most helpful is kind of a, what can we do right now sort of question while we're learning how to do more. <laughs> and that seems to be working as, as if there were a simple rule that, of what's made me happy in the last week, that would be that conversation. Thanks, Judy. And it feels like there's uh, hundreds and hundreds of groups like this that are all trying to figure out where are we, what are we doing, how do we do it, some of which are more advanced and more into action than others. And we're in some ways sort of crystallizing and, and making contact with each other. And one of the roles that I think is really important for OGM is to be a bridge and a bumblebee for the other groups and to serve the other groups with better infrastructure, with processes, with things we come up with and, uh, and do. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Kevin Scott Lauren. Uh, yeah, I've mentioned in here, I'm working on a series of uh, financial products and initiatives that are related to an, a, an interconnected economy versus the economy of rugged individualism. And the third one got approved uh, uh, and, and I'm, I'm dropping the slide share link in the deck, <clears throat> but it's a uh, friends and family funding for black and brown entrepreneurs who don't have a rich uncle uh, using a mix of equity and, and uh, donations that are a clever subversion of the tax law. Uh, <clears throat> there's this thing called a pooled income fund that places like Stanford use as a planned giving tool. And it turns out you can tweak it in a way that lets people invest a uh, hundred dollars and get essentially 50 cents back on, on these funds and, and a deduction and, and capital gains and all that stuff. So that equity revenue share money goes into uh, black and brown entrepreneurs who, who can't get debt. And it's a, it's a bridge step uh, beyond microfinance. And anyway, it's up and uh, the slide share, there's an FAQ if you're interested, email me. But uh, we're, a couple of foundations and some high net worth individuals are interested in, in uh, funding it here in, uh, in Asheville. It's led by uh, this African American woman I've been working with for a couple of years. And uh, anyway, I worked on it from like 6 a.m. to 9.30 last night and, and actually <laughs> people, were, my team was emailing back this morning. So I don't know, there's about 16 hours in that crazy deck. So anyway, uh, they're all kind of linked. That sounds great. Kevin, briefly, um, how is that different from micro savings programs as, a, as opposed to microfinance? Because micro savings are basically pooled uh, small completely donations. Different. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're com yeah, they're, they're completely different. I, I could, if you want me to explain, I can. Um, I mean, <clears throat> it's, it's revenue share financing. Uh, you give them equity, uh, but the people who put up the money get a deduction coming in. Okay. Um, and then they get a revenue share for life after the fund recoups your donation from the revenue share and then it okay. replicates and, and goes from there. Cool, thank you. Um, Scott Lauren Charles. Hi everyone, a um, couple things for me this week. Uh, the first is I agree with Judith and how things are starting to get traction and spread 
and it's caused me to think about Dunbar's number, which is um, was proposed by British anthropologist Robin Dunbar in the 90s, and it says that because of our brain capacity, we have approximately 150 people that we can maintain cohesive relationships with. You can argue it, you know, it's, it's 100, 150, 200. The point is, is that it's not 1,000. It's not 10,000. It's, it's a small group. And what I'm noticing is that the more people I'm connected with, and it's been exploding since I've been part of this group, the less well I'm doing with each of them because it's thinner. It's just these little touch points that are very exciting, but then I have less time to actually dive into each one of them. And it's, uh, it's been studied quite a bit. They've, done look, they've looked at Twitter, they've looked at Facebook, they've looked at organizations that actually, um, I can't remember the, the company, but as they got to 150 people, they found it more productive to split and make another building. And now they have a group of 150 people with a whole new parking lot. They're all right next to each other. But That's it's w these little WR groups. Gore. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, it's just a fascinating little thing. Uh, he also had some other numbers. Five people are the people that we spend 40% of our social time with. And 15 people, if you add, if you add another 10 people, that's 60%. So again, it's these small little groups. And the reason that, that it's, it's explained this way and, and something that I've known quite recently is people are the most complex thing that you'll ever interact with. Things are easy. People are, are not. And in order to maintain a relationship, if you have three people, you are you and the relationship with each person, but you also have to have an understanding of the relationship between those two people in order to make a conversation work at another person and now you, it, it just exponentially gets out of, out of hand. And so it's just something to think about as we think, how can we bring in collaboration? How can we develop these spaces when the group that I have on my screen feels really manageable and yet still bigger than I can even know all of you? And it's not a huge group. Um, so that's one thing to think about. The second thing was um, I found, uh, Doug had mentioned something about um, redesigning Zoom. Here's some things I'd like to have see in, in Zoom. And I saw an article this week and I thought it was really fascinating. They had three or four design firms come in and say, what would I do to Zoom? And one of the things I thought was most relevant to this group was that they had, let me read from here, give people a little map and they can drag themselves around into different groups. So the visual is there's these little groups of interest that you can actually see from sort of a top-down view, if you will. And then you, you move yourself into the group and it's different because they were talking about going to one of the conventions and how you walk into a room and you have no idea who's there and what they're involved in. The other thing that I thought was interesting about that is, is you can take yourself out into a white space and that's a rest area. So now you're, you're not necessarily involved in any of the groups. So, I thought those were two, two interesting ideas for this week. And Neil, did you want to chime in on that real quick? Just a very quick little one on, on Scott's point about moving in and out of rooms. And it was an experience I had many years ago, and I'm sure the more famous amongst the gathering here than myself would have had this on many occasions. Um, I made a couple of comments at a forum with about 50 people in, and then they were all breaking for drinks <clears throat> afterwards. And I went to the toilet, came back, and the groups had already formed around the wine tables and the coffee tables and so on. And I knew if I go there, this is the conversation I have. If I go there, this will be the conversation. This will be lowbrow, this will be highbrow, this will be something else. And in that moment of indecision, I just stood there and sipped my wine. And I realized there were individuals at each table looking at me. And within about two minutes, a group had gathered around me. And it was the people that weren't comfortable in the group they were in. And it was an insight to being the strange attractor. And so the, the strange attractor has to produce something different than what would otherwise be available, right? Because otherwise people will already be around it. And it has to be attractive enough and provided with enough empathy for them to see the sense of being with you 
So you can create relationship by being strangely attractive. Um, I just specialize in being strange. But the, the point is that uh, it's not just how do you join a group, but how do you attract people to join you through being different enough in the level that they're operating. And this again is part of that vertical differentiation, not just horizontal coordination and playing with those models around adjacent possibles and networks and seeing how to do that. But also recognizing that each individual you encounter could be operating at different levels if you give them the space to move into it. And so how do you give them the opportunity to show up more fully whole and they have to see that in you before they can connect. So I just wanted to bring that into that process. It's not just numbers, it's actually vertical depth as well. I have a couple of quick comments. Uh, Neil, were you wearing your like pirate badge and hat and parrot? Is that like what did it? Um, second- it was the, pe the peg leg, I think. That got the peg away. leg, yeah, that's, that's totally a strange attractor. Um, an old colleague of Pete's and friend of ours, Ross Mayfield, just announced on Product Hunt, basically a series of Zoom add-ons, a platform for extending Zoom, which sounds interesting, which I didn't have a chance to go look at. And uh, then we have Charles Pete Bentley. Uh, uh, no, sorry, Lauren Charles Pete. My apologies. Um, and then I have to switch rooms. So I will be muted, but I'm listening. Hey, everyone. And I wanted to say uh, hello, especially to George Ford. It's so nice to have you with us. And how exciting. And also, Jamie, another female. We always like that. So I just. Uh, Wanted to give a shout out to you too. And uh, uh, Scott actually presented uh, on Monday at uh, Kiko Lab, and it was it was delightful. He had just has like tons of tricks up his sleeve um, in terms of creative frameworks. So um, definitely, while we're checking out his stuff, uh, we were super excited to to um, hear him present and want to try out his. Uh, his creative frameworks and in Kiko Lab uh, in the future. And uh, what else? And uh, uh, Scott also uh, led us to, to Tony Caffrey, who's, you know, this, who has another um, problem solving uh, framework. And I'm meeting with him in my Zoom room tonight at nine o'clock. If anyone is interested, you can. Um, you can join. Scott, do you want to tell him, tell the group yeah, about him? So, he's great. so just really quickly, he's from UMass uh, and he teaches computer science and he has the best brainstorming book I've ever seen, how to break any creative problem. Um, I, I, I can't remember the name of the book, but anyway, what his, his uh, work is on the intersection between AI and innovation and his fundamental thesis is Humans are not as good without computers. Computers are not as good without humans. And he has a model that allows, it's a linguistic based model that allows the computers to do what they do, which is provide the options. And the, un, and, and the, the humans are the best at making the connections between those options. And, and that's kind of his, uh, his thesis. And he can't seem to get much traction on it, which is odd because he's got all the support behind it. And I think uh, this meeting with Kiko Lab is going to help. Can you throw his info in the chat? Awesome. Thank yeah. you. <clears throat> Charles Pete Bentley. Hi. Um, great to be here. I'm sort of uh, tucked in the corner of uh, the skating rink restaurant where my kids are out on the ice uh, having a class all week. Um, so I've been a little um, derailed by just be, being dad this week, which is great. It's wonderful. Um, getting, oh, so we have to give a, a lot of love and shout out to Robert Best, whose wife had a baby this week, the other day. James, a little boy. Uh, James Best, I gather. And um, so that's one of the big, biggest news. Um, another one is that we are going to welcome again Howard Rheingold on Monday at the Kiko Lab session. Um, noontime Pacific, nine o'clock in Central Europe. And that is continuing in a series of conversations on crap detection. So Jamie, um, going back to much earlier, I was resonating with your, your riff on re relationship with information and we would love to connect for sure um, about a bunch of things. But if you're around on Monday, you'd certainly be welcome as is everyone. Um, 
So that's like pattern jamming. It's an exercise that we've tried out a few times in the metacogs, um, which is kind of uh, reaching toward a pattern language, um, and in this case, a pattern language of crap detection with uh, one of the, the gurus of crap detection, Howard Reingold. We're also going to be, um, in the beginning part of the call, looking again at the learning garden, the, the, uh, the co-learning uh, with kids, pedagogy for kids stuff, also with Howard and a few others in our, <laughs> in our camp. Um, and I don't know what else. I, I, I'm feeling progress uh, amidst fra fragmented responsiveness these days, but uh, there, there's good stuff going on and um, just uh, gearing up for Monday with Howard. So thanks, check. Charles, thank you for the youthful sounds in the background. They're actually lovely. Um, I used to attend Quaker meeting when I lived in Connecticut and when a baby cries and during Quaker meeting, it's not like immediately usher the baby out. It's actually sort of the, the sound of God in the room and, and it's, it's treated very differently from, from what you would expect, it's lovely. I, I can leave the mic up, up if you want. <laughs> In this case, probably not. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. You can leave, right. leave the godlings to their, to their, uh, to their work. Um, Pete Bentley, Doug, please. Uh, good morning. Um, the, the emergent pattern for me ended up being I tweaked uh, the real-time transcription engine I'm using a little bit. Um, and uh, it's actually a lot better now. It's, it's um, amazingly it's running on the background and working well. Um, so uh, now there's still a lot more work to do, but it, I, I, I didn't expect that this morning and it ended up kind of happening and poof. So um, hopefully we'll get to share more in the future, I guess. Uh, the other thing that I thought was interesting, um, I saw a, a short post by Doug uh, Rushkoff. Um, he's posting little snippets of his book, Team Human Book. Um, and uh, I'll drop a link here. Uh, he said, um, with, with robots taking over our jobs, um, maybe, maybe we got tricked into thinking that we actually all needed jobs and that we needed careers. Um, so uh, that, that I thought was a really interesting, fast, uh, fascinating uh, observation and kind of reminded me actually of uh, the discussion going on on uh, April's flux list about uh, portfolio careers. Um, so maybe we some do. Some of my best friends have jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of my best friends have jobs too, but some of them don't. And so, uh, well, this, anyway. And part of that folds into sort of kind of the blue tsunami uh, question. It's like, okay, so if we can actually clear the decks and, and loosen politics so that we could do something, what might we do? And in that case, you'd want to have a brilliant sort of techno industrial policy so that you could achieve fully automated luxury communism the way we were promised so many years ago, right? Uh, Falk is a thing and uh, Matt doesn't want that. But, but that raises all kinds of questions that we haven't faced in centuries, which is like, but if people didn't have to go to work and didn't have to earn a living, wouldn't they shoot themselves because they'd find no meaning? And I'm like, Jesus Christ. Anyway, it, it, all kinds of interesting things get opened up by this conversation, which I really, really love. So maybe we do a, a, a pop-up OGM call on, on like clean slate, what does this mean? In fact, I, I'd love to do a sort of a blue tsunami call uh, to think about what that might look like. Um, Bentley, Doug, Ken. Hey everybody. Um, so uh, just a few personal things. I'm starting a new job this week. Uh, it's a part-time job. Uh, it's a startup dealing with interactive textbooks. Uh, and then I'm uh, working with Jamie on uh, debate and uh, helping people understand very complex issues like climate change and, uh, and uh, uh, just lots of stuff. Um, and then I'm, I've got several other projects to save the world. So, or we'll make the world a better place, right? <laughs> like everyone here. Uh, so I don't, have much interesting to share. Uh, I like the conversation that's going on. Um, so I'll be listening in. Oh, and I guess for uh, Jerry, um, I'm not sure I know the homework or are, am invited to that meeting on, on the, where we're trying to bring OGM together. Um, I'd like to participate. I don't have to if, if it's already full. Um, so so there's just an, an open, open anybody kind of call tomorrow uh, to follow up on what Matt says today. And then what Matt says today is going to set the agenda for the next couple OGM Thursday calls, as you will see. Uh, so I think you'll, you'll see how this is all 
uh, kind of unfolding. So great. Yeah. I've been out of the loop. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Sounds exciting. Cool. Totally want you in the loop. Uh, Neil, did you want to comment? Just a quick one. Uh, Bentley, where did you get the background that perfectly matches the tone of your t-shirt and when is the portrait shot happening? Yeah, uh, this is Olin Mills, 1980. Uh, and I just downloaded portrait backgrounds because I wanted something funny, but yeah. I don't know if Olin Mills, I don't know how big they are, but that's where we got all of our pictures taken when we were in middle school, so. Oh, okay. I was like, what's the Olin Mills reference? <laughs> it's a, it was a photograph <laughs> photography studio. Uh, everyone probably had something like that in their childhood. <laughs> Wait, it, was never... only, it was only a guess, Bentley. It was only a guess. <laughs> okay, yeah. just, just, just for fun, just for a moment, everybody pose like your high school photo. Like this. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, and now we have Doug, Ken, Matt. Okay, I, uh, it's been a very complicated <coughs> week involve, involving a lot of things, and I'm losing my voice from talking too much, uh, which is probably a clue to not talk too much. Uh, some of the issues are, uh, if you deal th with things locally, trying to connect the dots, the internet hangs in the background as a resource for connecting communities with each other. I think we've all lived for 20 or 30 years with the hope that the internet would be a learning, communicating, democratic environment. But the reality is it's more of a security and military and state control medium than we were ever prepared for. The issue that I've been facing lately is the degree to which uh, the internet and the technology companies and the banks together are a kind of sponge soaking money up out of the population into, into a few hands. And if we don't break that link between technology and finance, we're going to find that it becomes increasingly corrupt and working against us. Uh, and we need the internet to be a place for learning and open conversation. And we're losing it. And I don't know what to do about that, except to think that it's really important. So here from Northern California, that's the thing that's mostly on my mind, except to say, I'm finding it increasingly hard to be in a conversation like this without breaking down and crying. The, we're surrounded by a tsunami of pain and it's gonna get worse in the, in the next week, it's gonna get worse. Uh, the, the people have been unemployed for six, eight, 10, 12 weeks, no income, no resources, and they've got kids. It's just terrible and nothing is happening really. The food banks are running out of money. Anyway, you all know that story because you're probably all in it one way or another. Thank you, Doug. And uh, thank you for the sobering thoughts. And there is something happening. I watched some of the, the uh, Amy Barrett hearings and uh, when she did her opening conversation, she introduced her kids. She basically opened her, her presentation as if she was at a church social on Sunday. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. Your nomination is incredibly controversial. This moment is weird, like this crazy ass moment in history. You're pretending this is like a church picnic. It was insane um, in, its, in its absurd normalcy in some weird way. Anyway. Um, Doug, thank you for, for grounding us in, in all of the things that are happening. And the next month, the next month it, it could very likely be incredibly hectic and crazy. And uh, <clears throat> so we'll see where that goes. Um, Ken, how is our itinerant census taker doing? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is the final day of um, what's known as NARFU, the non-response follow-up count. Um, according to the internal census figures here in Northern California, we're at 99.98%, um, which might be a, uh, an accurate figure in terms of number of cases closed, but it's not an accurate figure in terms of number of cases correct. Um, I think I mentioned last week that I got so angry at what I was seeing internally that I actually contacted my um, uh, my representative, Jared Huffman, spoke to his office. Um, I don't remember what I told you, but basically they said, thanks for the information. There's only not much we can do. The Department of Commerce is not cooperating, which if Congress can't rein in the Department of Commerce, who the fuck can? So um, 
I joined Doug. I, I, very often at the end of these calls, I'm feeling very teary just because I, I don't know many of you, but I feel this love for being here, for being with this group of people who are so like-hearted. We're very different minded, but man, I feel the likeness of our hearts and it moves me deeply. And I'm on the other end of things experiencing this, this rage, this, I, I don't know how things got so broken and why we are so ineffectual at fixing them. Um, Somebody said to me yesterday, well, that's the government. And I was like, no, it's not the government, it's politics. I've met so many brilliant career civil service people who are dedicated to their work. They're not the ones fucking up. It's when a political appointee comes in and says, we're changing the entire management structure. We're throwing out all the, the intellectual capital that exists and, and negating it and saying, we're going to do it this way. Um, and it's just, it makes me so, it, rage is the only word I have for that. It's, it's way beyond anger. And then there's the despair of what's going on in the world, how many people are being injured. So I hadn't meant to go down this path. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> Took me in a different place. I was going to say I'm actually feeling incredibly grateful for clean air. Uh, the air cleared here on Saturday for the first time in weeks where I could walk outside and, and do my Qigong practice outside for a change because you know I do a lot of real deep breathing. This I don't want to be out there breathing 400 particulate air. So um, it's, it's been, uh, just a joy to recognize how much a simple thing, like being able to breathe clean air means, um, so I'm, I'm kind of all over the map. Um, I'm really looking forward to closing up the census. It's been, I mentioned to somebody that despite the craziness inside the census, it's kept me isolated from the craziness out in the world. Cause I've had such an extreme focus on getting things done. And, um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to just having some time off and being able to dive into what I've seen going by in OGM, all the, you know, I haven't had a chance to read so many of the things that are posted. So uh, I'm looking forward to that and just, you know, really feeling um, happy to be here with all of you again. This, this is a, a link in the chain of my sanity are these weekly calls. So thank you all. Um, Ken, thank you. And I just, let's go into a, a, a little bit of silence just to be with uh, what Doug and Ken just, just said. I'll bring us out. I was about to bring us out of silence and then that cuckoo was in the background. I'm like, okay, gotta wait for that. That's, that's, that was cool. <clears throat> um, and can just some framing that I'm using to preserve sanity, which is um, my belief is that a whole bunch of people voted for Trump because they want the system shattered and that he is actually scoring pretty high on that. That what you were living in, in one department of our government is what's happening broadly across the government that he gave his people instructions to go break this thing, make sure it doesn't work, disable it. Uh, in part because my higher level sort of uh, narrative on this is that the far right, the alt right doesn't have anything that would logically pass muster with anybody. So they have to break down discourse, dominate the field, you know, treat this as a power play basically, gaslight everybody. Um, in fact, accuse the other side of doing the thing that they're planning on doing, which I'm thinking of as flame throwing, not just gaslighting because it's an offensive strategy. And so uh, we're reaching this cusp where we could either slip further down that rat hole and go in a really dark place, <clears throat> or we could, uh, this could be the, the last thrashings of the dinosaur era, and we could break through into a really interesting, wonderful new place. And, and, uh, and so I, I don't think Trump's base wanders below 35% because there is a bunch of people that are dissatisfied with the system and like to see it being shattered. They want to see it chatted because they don't see any better future for themselves. So a huge thing that we have to do in a blue tsunami scenario is actually redesign the system, not reinstate the system. And I'm worried that Biden wins and then goes back to, takes everything back to end of Obama era by, by you know, hitting, re, hitting control. Uh, I, and I'm wearing my, my undo t-shirt. 
there's an eraser with control Z on it, <clears throat> right? Because that's like my feeling of what we have to, we have to hit control Z a whole bunch of times to sort of get back to where we were. Uh, Neil and then Matt. Very brief poem to capture a little bit about what's been said uh, called Crochet, if that's okay with the group. Soulful fractals from the mind, stream in flows of liquid love, threaded dreams that wrap combined head and heart like hand in glove, holes imagined, spaces filled, artisanal composition, tensioned, loose, and sometimes frilled, threaded hues positioned, touch and feel are finely tuned, heart and soul aligned, legs and hips warmly cocooned as love fills hearts assigned. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, Matt, we've prepared the table for you. All right. Um, all right, everyone. Um, it shows that my mouse is almost dead here and I can't find my charger. So we'll see what happens. Um, so quickly from an up, uh, you know, sort of from an update um, standpoint, um, Pete, I think it was you who put in the chat last week, um, a link to Robin Wall. Um, and I apologize for the, um, the pronunciation, but Kimmerer. Um, I don't know if that's, if that's true, Pete, that you put it in there, but um, I, I, she's from the Potawatomi um, tribes, indigenous people. And um, I, I put a link in the a chat earlier um, to her YouTube video. And I think there's something really amazing about um, one of the concepts that she's put out there, which is, or it's not even hers, but it's a deep, deep indigenous knowledge about the honorable harvest, right? Um, things like um, never take the first thing that you you find, um, ask permission for what you take, listen for the answer and respect that answer, take only what you need, use everything you take, be grateful, minimize harm, share what you've taken and then reciprocate the gift, give yourself back, you know, to the thing that you're harvesting. Um, and um, I'll say that the, the OGM has actually catalyzed for me a great, um, I think like many of you, sort of a, a great personal set of like reflection and I'm, I'm going through catharsis, right? I can feel, feel that and systems change for one of two reasons, enlightenment or, or, or catharsis and um, catharsis requires breakdown. Um, and I remember um, bemoaning Trump's um, I'm getting into power with one of my wise uncles who said, well, um, maybe this is what we need. Maybe the people got it right and that we need, we need the system to break down. Um, and as you guys all know that I've been listening and reading Latour um, and one of the things that Latour states about, as I understand it, states about why people are living in this, you know, sort of, um, um, disregard for everything that exists, you know, Jerry, like you were saying, and willfully trying to break things down is there's a recognition that um, the two ends of the spectrum, a spectrum of move into the future of modernism, which is also equated with globalism, is kind of this utopian fantasy that can't be achieved. Um, and the other side of modernism is sort of this conservativism and sort of um, um, going back to um, going back to what was in the past and and believing that the past is the glory days um, and um, you know so there's sort of this tension between this utopian view of the future and in this utopian view of the past and that's the spectrum that we're on and Latour says that that both of those utopian views um, for some of the people in this world hold no truth and therefore their only response to that no truth is actually, you know, burn it all down, um, make up fantasy worlds, QAnon and all this kind of stuff. And that's what we're, that's the reaction that's happened here. Um, and what he says is that reaction is actually not um, in some ways, not um, unwarranted. Uh, um, in fact, um, it's a rejection of, of this, of these stories. And I'm a, I'm a modernist, right? I've always been a modernist. I've always seen opportunity and wanted to move forward and always thought about, you know, kind of where we could get to if we only, you know, work together hard enough. And 
Um, and I'm recognizing that, that, that that's also false. Um, you know, and Latour sort of talks about sort of a, um, a real re-inhabitation of, our, of ourselves in the context of, of the small critical zone that we live. And what does that mean and what does that look like? And that's the third attractor that we need to move toward um, in his mind. Um, so that's been going on in my mind and kind of getting back to Robin Wall um, Kimmerer is um, this idea of indigenous knowledge. And indigenous knowledge is the knowledge that is built of the ecology in our ecology. And I, you know, I think about all these people, um, you know, Ken, that you're referring to in the, in the, in our government systems that are basically being tossed aside, and that's indigenous knowledge of how you know of how our government really works in its true concept. And so we've given up all of those things um, in in um, in favor of modernism. And modernism has the view of you can take whatever you want, and you can harvest the land, and you can. And now we're into a place where you can harvest the people. And all social media, and Doug, what you were talking about, social media as a, as sort of a, uh, not even just the internet, it's sort of as a part of the military complex or the um, capitalist consumeristic complexes that, that they're harvesting us the same way that we harvested coal and harvested the land. And, and I think that there's something really destructive there that we have to come to terms with. So that for me is my why of OGM. Um, and I don't know what OGM needs to look like. I know that there's plenty of people working on platforms. Um, you know, Scott, someone invented something called spatial, which is exactly what you, and I put it in the chat as well, which is exactly what you're talking about with some of these things. There is a proliferation of platforms and everyone thinks they're going to cure this thing with platforms. And I think, you know, that's also a, a kind of a techno futurism modernism that um, may be false as well. So with that said, as a um, conceptual background, let me just share my screen um, and share um, what I would propose as being a process for how we might move this group from what, is been, what has been an effective set of conversations into the next stage of our, of our being. Um, and so here's... Um, here's what I have as a set of objectives. And I think we need to align on these objectives. And just to, just to um, say this, we want to invite everybody who's been a part of OGM, whether they're on these calls or whether they're in discourse or whether they're um, lurkers or those things into, um, into this process. And um, there's still more to be worked out. But the hope is here is that collectively we can name our aspirations and intentions. We can put language behind them. We all are, have been attempting to name it, but how do we collectively name those aspirations and intentions? Um, I think we also need to define the boundaries and the edges of you know, the system that we're trying to create. And we've, we've done things like say, well, we should all be in about the food system, or we should all be in about the climate system, or we should be about education system. I think I heard today that you know, we should all be about the blue wave. Well, what are those edges? You know, and how do we can conceptualize um, the boundaries and edges of what we're creating? And that could be internal boundaries and edges as well, um, right? This is part of systems thinking here. Um, we have to articulate then the form uh, of what this thing should take and what is our operating system? And I use the word system, not necessarily technical, but you know, all parts of how this thing works um, and how, it, uh, how the pieces relate. Um, and then we want to launch an initial set of pursuits in the today, in the now, um, and organize those pursuits um, and activate some working, you know, some working groups and know how those groups are working and how those pursuits are working together so that we feel like we can focus on pieces of it because we know the whole is being um, uh, tended to. Right now, I think we're all just muddling about in the whole, which is good, but um, it uh, if this thing is so big, we need to break it up in, into pieces potentially. So that's what I have for objectives. Let me pause. Do these objectives resonate with people? Am I missing anything? Um, if we got this stuff done, would that be a good next step for us? So um, I'll let open up for a second. 
One question I just had, um, I want to ask, I've, we've actually kind of gone through this similar process with another group. Um, a group of us who have known each other for a very long time, we decided like how, how collaborative and overlapping are our projects really such that like we should probably just start naming what it is that we want to do and see if our combined technologies and talents could accomplish something that may not be what each person wants on their own, but is similar enough to our, you know, combined and overlapping goals that we would want to work together and lay down our differences essentially. Um, so one of the questions that came up is, is it okay to submit for consideration something that you've already built or your own complete set of processes and like for the society library, for example, like Absolutely. we have a specific method and tools and yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I know in talking and part of the, you'll see in the design of the process, everyone gets an opportunity to provide their individual perspective on this. And these individual perspectives are based on these conversations, but it's based on everything that we've learned to date. And I know Neil has, you know, a library of models and frameworks that he's used. I know, um, you know, uh, J Judy, you've been working on lots of frameworks and I mean, so this group is, is, is um, flush with ideas and models, frameworks and previous knowledge. And we don't want to lose that um, uh, kind of, our version of indigenous wisdom. Um, and so, yes, that stuff will be brought to the table, but ultimately, you know, what we're, what we're trying to answer is why do we exist? What do we stand for? What do we do? Um, who do we do it with and for? How, how will we know we're successful? What will distinguish us? And how will we work together, right? These are the kind of the core, the deliverables that we're working toward. And, and I don't pretend to think that in one, um, five hour session, we will get there, but this is what we're working toward. And there may be mechanisms for us to, to begin tracking against these things on a big board over time. Um, but um, I know I've wrestled with this with my organization and with organizations I'm you know, partnering with, I'm sure you have too. And so we want all of that stuff to come into, into fold. And so the process is going to be um, what we, um, Neil, yes. Yeah, just, just one observation and just checking in and if I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, one of my starting concerns when, when getting involved with this group was where is the power? Where is the money? Where is the legitimate authority? Where is the anticipated authority? And so in the context of any system, if you're coming in to try and disrupt something that somebody already thinks they own, already think they're doing, already has control of, my understanding now based on the conversations that we've had is that uh, there isn't a vested interest. There isn't a, uh, a particular ownership model that this is actually uh, an open slate in terms of how we co-define how to move forward together. So I just want to check on that if that's still the assumption because that was a, uh, a mental barrier for me in terms of how to engage with this. How carefully do I have to tread in speaking my truth if somebody else already has the truth, right? So just flagging that as a uh, something that might need to be uh, you know, po uh, posted up front, this is our intent in this way, um, because I think you need to give people the space to have that conversation rather than the assumption uh, that, hey, somebody's about to walk off with all profit. Because <laughs> yeah, that's one I of mean, the barriers I see everywhere I go. Yeah, um, I think that, um, I think that um, we have to talk, we have to talk about that. And, and, um, um, uh, and you know, um, um, I think that has to be in here and you'll see in the questions um, that that is that is one of, in the deeper level questions that is one of the things um, and you know share in the value. Um, I think that that's a I think that's a good thing to add. Thank you for adding that. Um, anything else on that before I jump into to process because I, I know we're at 11. Yeah, Jay. Just real quick, I just really appreciated your um, intro to this. So however that can be captured, whether that's kind of informing core purpose, um, I just wanted to, to note that. And then I'd also say it might be implicit, but I'd say small wins are really important. I think we've all been kind of yearning for that. So I just want to include that. Great, great. Um, um, and um, uh, that's included and I'll, sh I'll show you and I'll show you where, um, but I appreciate that, Jay. And um, Look, my intro, my intro was my intro. Each of you have your intro, and I think we have to capture all of those, right? Um, uh, yes, Pete. Um, I, I think another good deliverable is, is how we 
um, how we resolve conflict or, or mm. you know, where, in, in Neil's words, kind of where's, where's the authority? Yeah, and I think that's part of it is how do we work together? You know, resolving conflict, governance, all that kind of stuff, this operating principles and practices has to be embedded in, in that. And maybe let me, let me jump ahead because, um, because some of these questions um, were in, involved, but let me just talk quickly about process. Um, so what we'd like to do is to issue an individual assignment to everybody who's, um, who has stepped forward to be a part of this group. And you don't have to do it. Um, but it's an invitation to do the individual perspective and the individual perspective will be an assignment that gets you to think about a scenario of the future and here are all the questions and hopefully these questions cover the full waterfront and I'll come back to that um, in just a second. I don't want to get lost, but everyone will be invited to do an individual perspective. We want to launch that today. Um, we'll get that out. We're thinking that next Thursday, um, next Thursday's call uh, what we do is instead of doing a check-in like this, people will be broken up into, um, into small groups um, and individual perspectives will be brought into those small groups in one of uh, three ways. Um, way number one is during that check-in, if people, whoever is here can share their individual perspective in a, in a verbal standpoint and they'll have eight minutes to, to sort of summarize and synthesize just a few minutes to say, here's my perspective and you can bring visual aids or materials that you, you, wanna, you wanna bring. We'll, but we'll, maybe, it's, maybe it's a little longer, maybe it's 10 minutes per person or something like that and we get into small groups. The second way is if people want to just um, do a written piece um, those written pieces will be um, funneled into whoever's participating in the session and can participate in the session. And then people could also do a recorded piece. Um, you know, again, no more than I would say eight, eight, eight minutes or something where they record their, record their presentation and get it in. But people will have a chance to do an individual perspective and there's an assignment that's a prompt um, to do that. So you can produce something that's an artifact or you can come prepared if you're if you're more of a verbal, you know, like to be out loud, you can come prepared for next week's session to share that. Next week's meeting, we'll do a share. Um, we'll break people up into small groups um, and share. And we're gonna make sure in that share that anybody who's participating in the session itself um, is di we're dividing them across the share. So not everyone has to participate in the session to have their voice filtered in. I'll say, if you're participating in the session, um, you know, there's a higher probability that your bias will get uh, integrated, but we're going to try to honor everybody's voices. It's going to be really difficult, but that's part of what we're going to try to do. And then from um, October 22nd through the 29th, and we're trying to do it on the 29th, we can adjust that, but we're trying to get this in before the election because we're fear I'm fearful that if we wait until after election, we're going to have, um, you know, we're going to have other things that are on our hearts and on our minds. Um, and so just trying to, to fit it in, I know it's short, but during this period of the 22nd to 29th, that's per, the per people who are participating in the session's opportunity um, to uh, uh, reflect on what they heard in the individual thing, read anything that came in from the other sources and to watch any videos and to learn as much as you can um, during that time and to really reflect and process so that you come prepared for the session. Um, and then during the session, what we're gonna do is whoever can attend will be put into small synthesis teams and we're gonna create almost like continental drift. We're gonna have multiple synthesis teams pulling in all that information and trying to create um, you know, their first draft of these sets of deliverables, right? Um, and, um, and there's, again, there's a lot here that we have to wrestle with, but it's gonna be using the majority of those five hours to create the first draft of these deliverables in which they'll report out to each other, but, um, and we'll record those report outs, which will also then become a report out to everybody else. And then from there, um, you know, we will organize some, some after action um, conversations to do some synthesis and to create some deliverable teams and then those teams will get together and propose what their deliverables will be and get on like almost like a two week sprint horizon or a month sprint horizon where we might take every other one of these check-in calls from check-in to moving into or create a different call where we will then have each group starting to do some sharing and some comment period so that we get in some rhythm of pushing these things you know, together. And I could see, you know, 
like some groups working on the economic models of our things or the sustainability models, some group working on the technical systems and so forth, but we'll let that emerge out of the process. And so again, individual perspective, a sharing process of those individual perspectives. And then when we get together on the 29th, beginning to synthesize, um, the group of people will begin to synthesize those individual perspectives and then start um, moving into deliverables and, and, and actions. So that's the process. Um, divergence and then beginning convergence. Uh, yeah. Briefly, do you want do you want to describe the day of the 29th uh, for people more so they know what the commitment is? What's what? Yeah, the... yeah. I will. I um, let me start here, um, um, and I will pull my screen down. I don't know what you guys can see. Um, I don't know if you can see the top and the bottom of this page. Is that? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. we can see from assignment down to the last bullet. Great. And so, what your assignment is going to be um, as an individual assignment is. We're going to ask you to, and I'm going to highlight this and then unhighlight this. So this section here, the scenario, we want everybody to imagine, you know, an old, um, someone that mentored me said you, um, it, it's harder to get there from here than it is to get here from there, right? Which is basically this idea, if you think about a maze, if you start, you know, the best way to solve a maze is you start at the end and you work your way backwards. Um, versus starting at the beginning and working way forwards where you can get, you know, you can get lost in all of these holes. So, so of course, one the, of the, the, the Irish version, Matt, is that, oh, if I was going there, I wouldn't be starting from here. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, what we're trying to say is five years from now, we've, we've been on this remarkable journey um, and we've become this amazing force for good, um, however you define that. Um, and we've, what started out as an imaginative start, set of conversations between groups of, of us like this has actually turned into this self-sustaining ecosystem or ecology capable of materially impacting the world for the better. Um, and as we sit back and reflect on what's been achieved, um, we want each of you guys to take a moment to describe what we created together. And so we want you to build and to articulate your mental model of OGM five years from now um, and the story of what happened. And so there are more questions here than, um, than necessarily can be answered, right? But what we're looking for, um, and I'll send out this document, what we're looking for are really your view of these deliverables, your initial view of why we exist, what we stand for, what we do, um, who we do it for, how we know we're successful, what distinguishes us, how we work together, and how do we resource this endeavor and share in, in its value? Um, and, so, um, and so there's lots of questions. Why do we exist? What are our objectives? What, do we, what value do we create? What are the principles that guide our work? So some high level things down to what are the technologies we use? What are the policies, proce processes, and practices that we put in place? How were we funded and sustained? What were the operating principles and practices that we, we had to put in place? How did we govern this venture? Um, you know, what sources of inspiration did we draw on? What other models that came before us um, you know, did we pull into this, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, as you guys seen, what did we build? What did we leverage? You know, um, what mistakes did we make? Where did we struggle? What roles did each of us play in, in this thing, um, uh, in, in its success? And what motivated us to stay involved, right? We all have lots of things that we're involved in, what motivated us to stay involved. So these catalytic questions are not meant to be exhaustive. They're meant to be um, starting points weighs in for you to define the mental model. And some people will be way up here. Some people will be way down here. Some people will be way over here. Some people, but that's part of this idea of the continental drift and taking the diversity that is, that is of this group and bringing it into uh, fold. So everyone will have about a week to think about this assignment, um, to do as much as they can, um, to produce some sort of sets of artifacts, and again, if you're on the call next week, you'll have about eight minutes, eight to 10 minutes to share your vision. We'll do questions for clarification, not debate at that time. Um, we'll also then, um, for all the participants, we'll give them recordings of each of those shares, as well as recordings of anyone that anyone submitted that couldn't be here in live or any of the written objects that people couldn't, for people who couldn't be in the share live. Um, and then the process is going to be quite simple. Um, we're going to give a lot of time for synthesis. 
Um, we'd like to get more further into convergence, but we just think with the, with the robustness of the, converge, or the divergence that we're going to need time, we may need a second session. Um, we don't know, but we're going to see where we get to. But we're going to put people into small, um, you know, uh, tiger teams. I've heard people say this, but, but basically synthesis team groups. They'll have, um, you know, start out with a large block of time to begin to say, here's what I've learned. Um, um, there'll be an assignment, but basically it's around those kind of core deliverables. But it's here's what I learned. Here are the ideas that stimulated me and start to put some shape to um, start to put some shape to uh, those deliverables based on everyone's individual perspectives that they, they resourced. I'm trying to create almost, um, we're gonna do our own version of story threading. So everyone bring the tools that you wanna bring, um, um, whether it's in Miro, whether it's in the brain, and we're all gonna be working to do our synthesis. We'll give some, uh, like a 30 minute break uh, for lunch, for dinner, for, uh, snacks, whatever that is, um, for people to step away and reflect. And then we'll go into a second round of synthesis that is really um, pushing further down that path of creating kind of a, you know, these shared, uh, shared mental models um, to model out what the system looks like. Um, and then we'll end with a sharing conversation, which that will be recorded um, as a large group, um, which will be a deliverable going back to everybody who submitted any material and then post session um, um, we'll, um, we'll start a synthesis process. Again, these will be um, right now, um, Jerry Hamilton and I and Hank um, have a Tuesday morning hour call. I imagine we'll open that call up to beginning to do the synthesis where we're gonna identify buckets of work or um, area, you know, uh, trajectories of effort um, however you like to think about it. And then, um, and then um, what we'll do is it may be one or two calls. We'll come back to a Thursday group and then say, here are what we think the buckets are. We'll do a little bit of synthesis to make sure we have them right. And then people will vote with their feet. Um, and we do like, um, and we want to have equal numbers and good diversity in those, in those buckets. Um, so not all the techn technologist people go to the platform and not all of the, you know, philosophical thinkers go toward, you know, the ethos groups, if those are the buckets um, or are some of the buckets. Um, and then we'll start, um, start mapping out the first, their first deliverable is here are the first deliverables that we think we can produce and when we think we can produce them. And then we'll start that process of checking in and alignment and all that stuff. So it's going to be emergent. It's going to be loose. We're going to adjust along the way, but this is the framework that I have. All right. Whew. Questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah, can you say that again? <laughs> no. <laughs> Pete, how's the transcription working? <laughs> yeah, what was, what was the middle bit? <laughs> I have a question in terms yeah. of what you're describing, Matt, is the buckets, because the the buckets make a lot of sense in terms of alignment around philosophy technology and so forth but the integration of that is also really important and so how we hop back and forth between it because there's a whole different set of buckets that are goal-based in terms of outcomes and so yeah. i i don't know how we deal with that complexity but i think we need to deal with that complexity yeah, and how we've dealt with that in, in the past is we often find coming out of these sessions that one of the buckets becomes an integration team that doesn't live in the weeds, but, li but really um, um, uh, acts as a sort of a, the air traffic controller, the integration. We usually have one member um, of the integration team assigned to each of those sort of uh, domains of work. Sometimes we say that the first five buckets are this and we have another set of buckets that we put on the back burner. Um, sometimes we do check-ins and shares across the bucket so that there are mechanisms that we're going to need to continue to do that integration because that's where, that's the secret sauce here. You're absolutely right. The other thing is we often find that the integration team takes responsibility for um, working with the teams on um, cross communication and you know kind of publishing um, as well. Um, a lot of this is maintaining good you know communication discipline, like you like you said. So um, uh, we find that not only are there buckets that are kind of vertical, there are some buckets that are horizontal. There are some buckets that are about 
the system. And there may be some buckets which are about the system in action, meaning we might say we're a building OGM, but one of the reasons we're building OGM is to tackle the food system. And there's a bucket around the food system and the people working on the OGM system are in service of the bucket on the food system. So there, we, will, we will create a, a network map of how these things relate with each other as well. That's part of the synthesis is not just what the things are, but how the things work. Um, there are, you know, there are lots of different tools, but working with Max, who's a part of this, that I met through this group, he's, he's been showing me things in Miro that have, they're almost um, AI driven um, system map type things, you know, kind of, you know, topic, we're gonna need topic mappers. So there may be ways that the buckets actually are in service of the buckets, right? Um, and, and that's how we'll build meta, um, kind of meta categories plus, you know, kind of, you know, um, systems of action as well, right? Um, yes, Jay. Uh, yeah, I, to a certain degree, thank you so much, Matt. It's beautiful. Uh, to a certain degree, I think you were also talking about a collective story. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to volunteer as one of the tools kind of creating dovetailing journey curves because it's all collective, we've got our individual vision, our individual place where we came, our individual components that we're bringing, and the kind of shared innermost cave that could be supportive in this process. I, I, I love it. And um, as a facilitator, I just want to point out to the group uh, that the process is already working, right? Um, Jay, that comment, I would imagine that you are bringing that into uh, your individual perspective. And Judith, the comment you made is a part of this individual perspective. So now we're starting to advocate what we need. And that's really what we're asking for here is what's the mental model of, of how you think this thing looks in the future, as, as well as there are some questions, um, there are some questions here, which is where did we start? You know, and I think we need to say is, you know, what did we put in place first, right? Um, um, so this is what we're talking about. We're looking for, all of your ideas on this, and this is what we have to sort through. And, um, and part of it is we're trying to bring into the conversation the complexity so that we can then um, start to work to the other side of the sort of the, that kind of the elegant models that we're gonna use to help us you know, move this thing forward, right? Yes, um, 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 and I'm sorry, I, um, um, I don't know your name. I, um, and I can't see it on with my share view, but please. Um, George. Matt. George, nice George, thank you. Matt, uh, I heard uh, you mentioned something about the call on Tuesday morning. Can you say more about that? Yeah, um, so um, on Tuesday AMs, um, Hamilton, uh, Hank and Jerry and I, or we, that was our first call. And we've been doing that every, every week since um, March. Um, and that's where we said, okay, how are we gonna get OGM off the ground? And um, just to be clear, one of our first action items was, boy, we need to just create an open invitation and get people excited. And um, George, your involvement this week is a demonstration that that, that objective is being met, right? Um, and, um, you know, uh, it's so great to see some people returning. There's also great to see new people coming in every week and our group is growing. So now we feel like we have a critical mass of di you know, diverse um, thinkers. We wish we had um, you know, uh, more um, uh, underrepresented populations on this call, but we do have a good start um, you know, there. Um, and so we feel like we're ready to kind of take this next step. But those Tuesday calls, which are kind of organizing calls, where the Thursday calls have been kind of checking calls, we may, we may open that call up or create another call. I think we have to decide, but we're, we, are, we are focused on organization and moving this forward versus you know, the relationships and the connections. And Jerry, please. Um, yeah, and I'll just explain a little bit more of the history too. And, and, and I think going, going back to the question Neil asked at the start of, of this conversation. Um, so, uh, Peter van der Ora connected me to Hamilton, who connected me to Matt. We all started talking and we were like, holy crap, there's something really interesting here. And so we started talking on Tuesday and Thursday mornings back in March. 
Mm. And we were talking like that for a while. We had a rhythm going where we were like thinking this thing through. And um, the three of them uh, work at Collective Next and we're pitching projects. So Neil, you're asking like, how's this funded or who's behind this or whatever. And part of the idea was to try to sell some gigs that would fuel this, this project so that this project could grow and become a real thing and become maybe uh, a part of what Collective Next does and how it does it. So, so you know, Matt was like, these OGM ideas really, really smell good. I think this might be describing some of the future of our enterprise or something like that. Um, and then we were like, well, let's invite people into the conversation. So we opened the Thursday morning calls and turned them into what we're having right now. And so we're still meeting on Tuesdays and talking about what's up, what's going on uh, and so forth. So we could repurpose the Tuesday call to be project team check-in, to be something else, et cetera. It's just, it's just the rhythm that we've been holding. And um, I'm involved in, a, in a, I'm sort of in, in pitching a project or two that could easily fuel uh, OGM efforts. And I think, I think part of the goal of the workshop is to figure out how exactly does that work? Like, like what does it mean to have a container? I always describe OGM as a container, not as a platform, not as a single company, but as a, as a container for things that could be as different as some open source software that we just released into the world and commercial projects that are paying some people in this group to do work that is super skilled like story threading or storytelling or whatever else. Um, and so fleshing that out as part of what th this project would be like. Um, and, and so that's so far, none of these projects we've pitched has actually closed. So we don't have revenues coming into OGM of any kind. We haven't filed any paperwork to become a for benefit or a corporation or an LLC or an anything. Um, and my bias is toward, you know, public benefit corporations or some, some sort of uh, open, open structure. But part of the question here is, how, you know, part of what happens here is how do we work? How do we organize? Um, so I'm hoping that some of those questions come up and get answered in the process of this workshop. And, and then some of us are interested in all sorts of different slices of the horizontal and vertical aspects of, of what we're talking about here. Uh, so I think what we're trying to open up is, how do, we, how do we get those conversations to be really fruitful, to feed back into the whole so that we can build this little puppy as we fly it? Because there's several different ways in which we're kind of bootstrapping this as we in fact uh, have the conversation. And this could easily be a nice conversation where we check in on Thursdays and it could be a community and that would be satisfying because I think that the humans we have here and the, the like-heartedness we have here is valuable in and of itself and in fact, the danger is that we pollute that by over commercializing it. So I think we need to figure out as a container, how do we hold both? How do we, how do we manage, you know, intellectual property conflicts or uh, whatever, fairness and distribution of re issues are going to come up if we're successful. And if we have a strong community and a lot of trust, I think those things will play out really nicely and we can figure it out. And a, a piece of what I'm hoping OGM is, I'm hoping that we model for other organizations how work happens in the world. What are the tools that we use to share what we know and to, to discuss and debate things, um, how all this works. And not that we're gonna invent all of that because as Jamie said earlier, there's a whole bunch of organizations who've been wrestling with all these things and have templates and have, and have working methods that are very copyable intentionally because they're working in the open as well. So how do we pick the best of those, integrate them and make this work? Other than that, I got nothing. Yeah, you know, and we've, um, you know, I've been working on a project trying to get it off the ground with Jay. Um, we, we kind of are in a strategic pause there. That one's a little hard. I'm work, I'm trying to sell some OGM type things to, you know, two of our clients. I mean, we're talking about some really big, complicated, um, you know, long-term sales cycles on, on some of these things. Um, and Hank will attest that part of the problem is, um, at least with our clients, is they want us to collapse to building things that fit within their systems. Um, and um, what we want to propose and what we want to do is to say, we will not sell you something that fits within your system. What you have to do is recognize that we can help you build a completely different system for thinking about these issues and problems, you know, thinking about things. And, and therefore, you know, what we don't want to do is to just to view them as consumers and we'll give them whatever we need so that they'll buy it, um, you know, and so that's a, gonna be an interesting tension as we go through this, right? Um, but I can see, I, right now, just from a collective next standpoint, I can see projects where we need to ping the, wor the world of OGM for um, interesting thinkers who can help look at those problems in different ways than corporate America or corporate, you know, Europe 
or those sorts of things. And so um, I see this network as being really powerful, um, but we, you know, we have to think about how that's going to work and how it's sustained and, you know, those things. Um, any other thoughts? Because this has been great adding to these questions. And there's a lot. You can see, you know, this is, this is big. <laughs> you know? There's another, I don't mean to interrupt, but there's another dimension of, you know, as this grows organically, which I believe it will, and perhaps very rapidly, how we manage that growth and engagement will be critical. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't mean manage in a control sense exactly. I mean, manage in terms of engagement, um, involvement, positive action, so that it keeps growing. And that's something we should spend some time discussing at the right point. Great. Harry, do you have a link in your brain to other efforts that are sort of like this? Oh, yeah. Um, I'll put a link in the chat right now. I've got, well, I have, I have a link called OGM Neighbor Communities, which includes the category you just described, but mixed in with a bunch of other efforts that are kind of OGME. So I don't have one that calls out uh, major efforts uh, like Society Library, that have, that have sort of gone and formalized a bunch of different working processes. So they're, they're folded in a with a whole bunch of others, but I'll, I'll put that thought in the, in, the, in the chat right now. Excellent, thanks. Just picking up on that, the peer-to-peer -peer group and, um, and the commons-based principles are also very powerful uh, mechanisms uh, that would also increase the, what's the word? Not so much the legitimacy, but the visibility in, in this group. So I posted the, the Aid Commons principles up above and they, they cover some of the things, including what Judith was saying as well. We want to grow it, you want to bring people in, but you're, probably, you're going to have, probably have some sort of entry requirement. You, know, you, don't, you don't turn a three-year-old loose with the keys to the car. So how do we, well, you could. But, but the point I'm trying to make is that um, you're creating containers with different levels of engagement uh, on behalf of the whole, but you're trying to protect without pathology the, the core DNA. And so there's question marks here over how do you make sure that the, there's due diligence around who is allowed to play in the space uh, that can do it respectfully. So it's those sorts of issues, not just the conflict resolution, but what is the container and how do we make that work? Yeah, how did, how did we invite new people in, I think is an interesting question. And um, um, what's so interesting is I pushed Jerry on this early on and Jerry said, well, you just invite people and you see who shows up and if they're lurkers, they're lurkers. And if they're this, they're that, and that's okay. And um, so I think philosophically, we're, there's some really interesting debates there. You know, do we need to manage it? Do we want to manage it? If we do, how do we, right? So I think, um, I think these are all great, you know, great things for us to debate and to, to think through. Yeah. Go ahead, Neil. Just wanted to qualify that if I, if I could. That works fine for a volunteer agency doing good for nothing, right? It doesn't work as well when you're starting to throw pots of money around or projects around and you're randomly challenging the group that's already got uh, an effort and a cohesive team with a new player you've just parachuted in because you thought they were the right person. So you need mechanisms for how you engage and how you allow entry that doesn't tip over what it is you're trying to create that might lay the golden eggs to keep more happening. So it's, how do we I, get to I under I understand yeah. your, I mean, I understand your belief here. Um, but again, um, I want to leave part of this process, and I just want to state this, I want to leave it open for everybody to bring whatever it is. And if you feel strongly about that and other people feel strongly about something else, how do we reconcile and work through those, you know, those differences? And, and I think that's going to be important, right? You know, this is as much about us going through a process like this to see how we navigate these complicated issues, right? So two quick thoughts before we wrap our call. One is uh, that uh, in the chat I posted earlier, a bunch of design role model design principles that has Ostrom and a whole bunch of other really interesting things. And then, then I got to thinking right now from what Neil was just saying, about the peer-to-peer -peer community, peer-to-peer -peer foundation, Michelle Bowens, et cetera. There, there are many really interesting large-scale projects going on that are neighbor communities that, that, that are, are next to us but not the same as us. And I think this exercise should help us figure out how are we different from those? What have, what do we, how do we overlap with them? What have we borrowed from them? What is our mutual DNA? Um, 
how do we operate that helps them or, 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 you know, you know, or bridges them or something like that? Because I, because I think that our ethos is different from most of us. If we found an organization out there that was 10 steps further down the civilizational curve than we are, but had exactly the same structures, we should just join them. Like, like we should just go be a part of them because one of the problems here is that there are too many projects in the world. So, so I, I think that what we're doing is considerably different. One of my hopes is that our meanderings here on how to build software that helps us share what we know is that we invent the next storytelling platform and the next decision-making platform and that other people wind up using it because they're like, holy crap, this thing that these people came up with is better than going into some forced choice model or some this or some that or, or incorporates a whole series of models that we could then work through, something like that. So, so I think that those are the kinds of explorations that we can be engaged in. But, but what, I, what I like about uh, how Matt and his team have framed the exercise is that I think it will, it will let us enrich the conversation and deepen it into all these different corners that we're really interested in, in uh, understanding because each of us is trying to figure out, oh, so what is this and where do I, where do I apply my life energy? Great. Um, okay. So next steps, guys. Um, um, we need to, um, Jerry, maybe I can send you this material. Um, you can maybe do a quick, like, little video, one of your classic little video things um, that invites people and tells them kind of what's going on and then, um, and then sends out the assignment and everyone will get this. Um, and then um, and hopefully we can get that out today or tomorrow so people have, um, you know, the weekend and, and early next week to get, you know, things um, in place. Cool. One last thing I just want to get in the conversation because I don't think we mentioned it during uh, is on the okay. 29th, the intention is to have a five hour workshop. Now it's in the schedule and all that, but, but we would love it for that to be an RSVP workshop and for people who, who show up for it to commit to stay for the five hours. The rest of this is drop in, drop out, do whatever you want. But for the people on the 29th, we really would love, would love, love, love for people to be committed to be there for the whole process because that's really gonna make a difference in our ability uh, to get through it together. That's the only thing I wanted to add in so that we're, we're clear on that. And, and, the reason, and the reason we want RSVP is, is not, um, you know, not to keep people out. The reason we want an RSVP is because we want to know our numbers so that we can engineer, you know, groups and, you know, those sorts of things. So, um, uh, and the full five hours is, you know, one thing that I've known is when people pop in and pop out, you have to start over. Um, and so we want to, we want to build momentum through this. Um, um, cool. Totally agree and support. Okay. Thank you. Any other last minute questions before we wrap this call? I've got one, Jerry. Oh, please, Pete. Um, real quick for George and Jamie and whoever else. Um, another part of OGM is the mailing list. Um, make sure you're on the mailing list. And there's also a, a discussion forum uh, called Discourse. Um, so send Jerry an email or me an email and, um, and get yourself on. I'm pretty sure everybody in this call is on the mailing list because I've been adding everybody manually. So I know <clears throat> I'm not sure about Discourse. So we have to figure that out. That's a good point, Jerry, because these friends that I want to invite that are thought leaders, one is on the OGM list, but I don't know if she's on the discourse list. And another one, um, I don't think she has joined OGM yet. So. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, uh, Neil, last, last word? I just one quick question. The status of the document into which we were dropping thoughts, diagrams, ideas previously, how does that play into what we're doing here? And or is that still a working document or what's happening with it? We're going to pick that up tomorrow and compare it and contrast it with this document and see what see the beginnings of how these things may fit and where we're where we're heading. Okay. Yeah, that's Wonderful. that's Thanks. sort of like a um, you know a be beginning set of conversations between a you know a group of people and what we want is each of you guys to individually kind of step back, draw from whatever's happened, and then to put you know to repropose what you you know what we think. Um, yep. And, 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 and we might build back into that document, right? And Jerry? Can you do that in Google Docs or in Discourse or where? It'll, uh, it'll be in Google Docs linked from Discourse. We'll do that. OK. Um, and one, one last thing is a lot, many of us have particular domains of interest, whether it be the food system, uh, agriculture, uh, education, finance, whatever. We're trying here to design a system that'll hold initiatives in multiple domains. So we're not that focused on how to solve the problems of a particular domain. That's not this quest. 
Um, this is a quest to organize us so that we might actually then go say, awesome, who's interested in food system, agriculture, et cetera, go and come back and report in. And like, we need to understand what that flow is and how that work works. Yep. And is there a place for a kind of meta conversation about what the implicit and hidden assumptions are of what the different groups are doing? I think we need to create that on discourse. And I've been extremely guilty of not participating enough on discourse. So I think I need to get over that and get in there. And that's a really good place to host that because um, that's an important conversation, but that will swamp other, other conversations if we don't kind of uh, put it in, its, in, a, in a place. Yeah, and you know, in, in, um, I think, you know, again, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, if you think the answer is yes, we need it, I think that fits into what you would propose here, right? And I think this, there's a question here that says, you know, where is it, um, and I, there's some editing, but where do we focus and what problems do we work to solve? I think there is, there is the, prob the meta problems of what is OGM trying to solve, but there's also what are the problems that OGM is applied to solving? And we have to, we have to talk about both of those things, right? Um, okay. Good comments. Just um, if I can just pick up quickly on, on, on Doug's point that I tried to start a conversation around that and the entry of those that came into that comment was not sufficient to have that conversation. And mm -hmm. so this is the, this is the, the challenge. You then end up having to try and administrate the what are we actually talking about here in big picture meta stuff. This again is the vertical differentiation. It's not exclusivity, it's capability and maturity, capacity to hold complexity. Correct. And so there will need to be some sort of mechanism for holding uh, generative discourse at multiple levels. And I'm just flagging that that is a challenge. And I hear what Doug's saying because it's a barrier to uh, those that can see more complexity staying in. And it's a barrier to those who wanted to have a conversation and feel they've been left out. And we've got to work out how to do that. Yeah, these, this, is, this is definitely one of the biggest challenges that we have. Right? Agreed. That's a very important dynamic tension. Mm -hmm. um, excellent. Thank you guys. Um, we'll get something out, out to you guys. Obviously, you know, you can start your assignment now by just trying to frame how you imagine this thing working in the future. Um, that's the, ultimately we're looking for your, meta, your, your mental model of what is OGM in 2025. So um, um, we'll, we'll get this out to everybody. And for those posts we need, we're going to put a uh, word limit and a time limit on whatever posts are created just to force brevity, because we won't have time to read 15 page posts by everybody, but we will have time to read 1500 words or 2000 words from everybody like, like that we can get through. So we, we need to somehow in, uh, enforce some brevity in our expressions to each other for this stage. So if a picture's worth a thousand words, I can only use one and a half pictures. Is that right? Actually only like two thirds of a picture. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Y'all are awesome. Thank you, everybody. Let's be careful. Out thanks, there. everybody. And great, great effort, uh, Matt and team. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you Matt, so thank much. You. Well, Amazing. thanks, everyone, Fantastic. for your feedback and input. And we'll, um, I'm looking forward to taking this to the next level. Wonderful. Me too. Everybody stay safe. Yeah. Bye. Stay safe thanks. Well. Yeah, get, get some rest, Ken. Yeah, I plan to. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>